Hey everybody, welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. It's the 7th of November, 2014, and this is episode 19. Give the people what they want. <laughs> I have attempted to record this about six times. Some of it has been computer error. Some of it has been, I, I swear, I don't know what kind of gunked up oil is going on in my brain today, but I can't stop swearing. I can't stop getting stumbled over my own words. I can't stop getting distracted. I'm just going to start all over again. Let's see if it goes better this time. All right. So give the people what they want. Just to explain a little bit behind this idea before we get started. And then I've got some businessy type things to talk with you about. Um, the basic idea of today's show is that um, when I look at a lot of the the knitting and crochet patterns, and I, well, I'm just gonna really gonna talk about knitting patterns that come out, and a lot of the knitting photography and a lot of the styling. Um, I just I find that there's kind of a narrow window of what's popular. That there's a lot of that most of the patterns fall into this kind of uh, Pinterest real simple style aesthetic that suits a certain kind of woman but leaves a lot of people out that there are a lot of people who would probably like to have knitted things that are really not represented on in a lot of what you see in interweave knits folk knitting twist collective i mean i'm not nitty i'm not necessarily picking on these on these publications specifically and, but Ravelry in general, when you look at sort of the, the wide base of patterns, it's not any specific publication. It's a particular kind of aesthetic that a lot of online savvy knitters tend to promote and reward. And, um, and I just think that it's, it's a little narrow. I like it too. I love, like, a, I, I look at the stuff that I see on these, on these sites and I just, I adore them. But I wonder... I just, I'd like to see more diversity in knitting photography and knitting styling and knitting patterns. And I got thinking about this today because I have another yarn that I'm reviewing today. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to make with it in order to review it, um, I just felt like the yarn was really perfectly suited to kind of utilitarian outdoor gear. Not necessarily just menswear, but uh, that's that is what I ended up ended up knitting is something for my dad, and it's funny because when I went to look to see later what other people have knitted with this yarn, it's all the kind of stuff I was talking about, like striping striped shawls, um, tams, slouchy hats. I just thought, isn't that interesting? You know that. That even a, a yarn that you know has this kind of rustic feel to it and and the and the company actually has this kind of rustic feel to it still kind of gets pushed into that into that category and again I'm not I'm not laying blame or pointing fingers here I just think I'd really love for us to kind of expand our horizons a little bit and how we think about uh, what we can do with yarn and with knitting so um, so that's gonna be kind of the, the focus for today, but I have a bunch of little businessy things to talk about before we get started. One of them is that I wanted to give a big thank you to Stacy Dawson of Mustache Yarns and the Mustache Podcast, who uh, I think was the first one to notice <laughs> that I stealthily added a donation button to my podcast site. It's the podcast section of darkmatternits.com. And, uh, and I just put it up and I didn't really want to say anything about it at first because it's, it's not like I, I want people to give me a lot of money. It's just that the podcast incurs some costs and I know that, you know, some people like to give some money to, to podcast to kind of support, support the podcast. Um, the costs mainly come from hosting and, um, from file storage and from shipping uh, prizes for the most part. So, you know, they're not, they're not exorbitant costs, but they're enough that I thought, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put that up. And Stacy very nicely gave a, a really generous donation and for which I am very, very grateful. 
So I'll just let you know it's there if you're so inclined. Um, and if you, I know a lot of people don't, um, don't name people by name unless they have permission. I generally am going to take the other approach that unless you tell me not to thank you, unless you tell me you want to stay anonymous, I'm going to go ahead and thank you by name. I just feel like if you're going to, if you're going to do something nice for me, I'm just going to thank you. If you don't want me to thank you by name, just tell me, leave, just leave my name out of it. And I will, I will do that. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing I have to give thanks for is um, I was sent a pattern this week by Jennifer Lassonde, the Ayla Grace shawl. And it's a lovely, uh, simple shawl pattern that requires one skein of fingering weight yarn. So it's kind of the classic sock yarn shawlette. And it looks like it's a uh, just a really nice combination of simple texture, eyelets, garter stitch, and stockinette. And um, you can kind of see the, ah, that crease is from my fold in the paper, by the way, not a fold in the shawl. But Jennifer sent this to me, sent a copy to me very kindly, and also said that she would be happy to donate uh, a gift copy to one of you. And so I, I'm going to put up a thread on Ravelry uh, in our in our Ravelry group, Dark Matter Knits fans, and um, and I'm going to ask the question. Um, actually, I'd just be interested to know what yarn you would like to use to knit this shawl. So it can be any yarn from your stash, or perhaps a yarn you're you're thinking about getting. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but it would just need to be, you know, a regular sized skein of sock yarn, fingering weight yarn. I think it would really work with just about anything. Um, so thank you very much, Jennifer, for for giving us that. It, that was the Ayla Grace shawl, and it's a new pattern that's available on Ravelry. Uh, other things that have been going on in the last couple of weeks. Um, I was interviewed on another podcast, Marley Bird, whom you probably know. Who She's had a, a podcast called Yarn Thing for about, uh, I think, seven years now. And she is doing a series this month uh, called Podcast November, where she's interviewing different podcasters. And I was the first first one to get to go. I had such a fun time talking to her. It is, if you're up for laughing, <laughs> then this is a good one to listen to. <laughs> we just got each other into hysterics at one point. So, uh, yeah, if you've not listened to your own thing before, definitely go check it out. She's on blog talk radio now. So her shows actually air live originally and, uh, people can call in and win prizes. And then after the fact, it is available as a, as a podcast that you can listen to online. So I'll obviously give you a link in the show notes for that. Um, I am tomorrow. Well, no, I'll wait on tomorrow. While we're reviewing what's happened in the last couple of weeks, we also had Halloween, which was very, it's my favorite holiday. I love it. I love dressing up. And um, and what was particularly fun this year was that normally my son wants a store-bought costume because he has something very specific in mind, or he, he'll do something like he'll have some other store-bought, like a past year's store-bought costume, and he'll just go ahead and adapt that for whatever he wants to be. So you, uh, he, I think he spent the last three years being zombie something or other. Uh, but this year, he decided he wanted to be Legolas, which required something a little more specific. And we had a total fail trying to find a commercial pattern that, that worked. So, and it was it was actually really frustrating because... I thought, okay, with the, with the new Hobbit movie coming out in December, surely there will be some Hobbit Lord of the Rings type stuff that's available. No. We found one Gandalf costume, like a used one, not a used one, but like an old one at Goodwill. And, um, and we tried, we tried adapting some other costumes. Like we found some ninja costumes that might have worked, you know, with some tweaking, but they were so cheesy. I mean, like $35 for this really crappy piece of polyester, like basically a polyester bodysuit 
with some stuff really badly printed on it. I mean, it was just, ugh. So Liam says to me, well, hey, you know, why don't we just, why don't we just make my costume? Sorry, I apparently just <laughs> made myself bleed. That's nice. Here, bleeding on the podcast. I'm not starting over. No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've done it enough times. <sighs> Sorry if that grossed you out. And now I'm going to bleed. Um... Where was I? Oh, yeah. So he says, let's just make it. And, you know, and by let's, he means mostly that I will make it. He does like to help. But it, uh, yeah, when you're down to the wire, I mean, we were like four days out from Halloween. And, you know, it's mostly going to be mom doing it. So, um, so we go to, do we go to the fabric store, the craft store, and we found a bunch of great stuff. We got some fake leather to make like a tunic for him. And I had just enough left over that I was able to make a quiver as well to put his arrows in. And um, and it was super simple. I mean, one of the things I've learned from doing a lot of crafting over the years is that you really don't need to complicate this stuff too much. Like, I really don't know how to sew. I'm a terrible sewer. But, um, but I knew that if I just slap down one of his t-shirts and drew a chalk line <laughs> about an inch out from the edges of it because the leather wasn't really that stretchy so I thought I probably better make it fairly big and then I just seamed it up and kind of cut you know a little Henley type slit in the front and sewed that back so that he could get his head through more easily and, uh, and it looked great I mean and the stuff it was the kind of fabric where you didn't really have to hem it. I did in a couple of places just to kind of make it look a little nicer, but I didn't around this part of the collar and I didn't on the, on the sleeves. I just left them raw. Um, so we did that and we got him a plastic bow and arrow set that had like the suckers on them, popped the suckers off, painted the yellow bow and arrow. Cause it was like yellow plastic. We painted those brown and actually it was kind of cool because the, the, I didn't buy the right kind of paint. It wasn't really good paint for plastic. So some of the yellow showed through, but actually it was kind of cool because it sort of looked like wood grain. Um, and and then the arrows, we bought these little craft feathers and glued them into the, like put, pop the suckers off and glued the arrows in, or the feathers in. And um, what else did we do? Oh, we got some gray felt to just, you know, because it was cheap. Got some gray felt and I made this really simple cape. I mean, I literally just cut out a trapezoid and um, and flipped part of it down so that it kind of looked like a collar and sewed a little um, metal frog onto it so it could clasp in the front. And is there anything else? Oh, yeah. We got these. So Legolas in the movies is often wearing these kind of, they look like quilted leather gauntlets on his arms. And the quilted leather was a little too expensive and it was even fake leather, but it was still expensive. But um, we found this craft fur, like faux fur that kind of looked like bear fur. So <laughs> I just cut, you know, some rectangles out of that, punched some holes in it and laced some uh, some leather cording through so it could, he, he could tie those on. And I think that was it. Uh, it took a while, but not nothing too, nothing too ridiculous. He wore my boots because we're almost the same size now. I had these kind of elf-ish looking boots. And he's got blonde hair that goes down to about here. So I was able to braid it in a sort of Legolas-like fashion. He looked awesome. I'll have to I'll have to link a, a picture of him in the in the show notes because he looked really, really cool. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram, you've already seen it. But uh, yeah, I'll link it get in the show notes so that was fun and actually Halloween was full of lots of drama because uh I live in a I live in a gentrifying neighborhood in Austin not really gentrified but uh, this is the kind of neighborhood where you don't really want to look too closely at where the group homes are you know what I'm saying uh our house has been broken into before a car has been broken into a bunch of times you know, it's just, I don't really feel unsafe here, but it's a little sketch in terms of theft and, uh, and, and also in terms of, uh, drug sales and so on. 
So there was a drug bust on Halloween, and I'm sure there are drug busts all the time, but this one was especially dramatic. So I'm sitting on my computer at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Halloween, and I hear this, uh, I hear what sounds like a megaphone. And somebody's saying, like, we have you surrounded. And I'm thinking, I know my son's watching an iPad in the other room, and my husband's listening to the radio in the kitchen, but it doesn't really sound like it's coming from either of those places. So I go in the backyard and I listen. Sure enough, I can hear a megaphone coming from, as it turns out, a couple of blocks away. Uh, police saying, we have you surrounded, put down any weapons. And I'm like, oh, crap. And my, my, at this point, my son and my husband have come outside to join me. And I'm like, get back in the house. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're checking out the local news and neighborhood listserv. And it turns out, like, slowly the details start to come out that, there's this guy who's been selling meth in the neighborhood and the police had come over to bust him and he had barricaded himself in his house and was hiding in the attic. So they didn't know if he was armed. So they called a SWAT team. SWAT teams outside, like rifles pointed in. They threw in a tear gas canister. They had robots. This is kind of cool. They had little robots that could like zip into the house and zipped all around, like trying to find him, figure out where he was. And that's how they knew he was in the attic. Five, five hours it takes to get this guy out. Turns out he wasn't armed, but he kept refused to keep his hands in the air. So they they uh, pumped some sand pellets at him, which knocked him down. Oh, the drama in the neighborhood. <laughs> and then all the... Oh, goodness, all the self-righteous folks on the neighborhood list serve afterwards about how are we going to keep this hood safe? Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah, and apparently as he uh, as he was being put in the police car, he was screaming to free Yolanda to come get him out. I'm like, oh, man, dude, I hope Yolanda doesn't get you out. Yolanda's got better things to do. You're a loser. So that was fun. <laughs> that all got wrapped up like... About half an hour, 45 minutes after trick-or-treating got started. Uh, so as people are coming to the house, I'm telling them, hey, happy Halloween. Here's some candy. By the by, you're probably going to want to stay off of Briarcliff tonight. <laughs> awesome. So that was Halloween. Uh, tomorrow, I am going to Kid and You, which I am really excited about. It's a local fiber festival that's in Bernie, Texas, which is um, mo kind of closer to San Antonio. It's uh, basically between Austin and San Antonio. And, uh, and it's organized by a woman who uh, also organizes a winter fiber retreat that I always go to. And uh, it has a really nice... It's one of those fiber festivals that caters to the spinners and the weavers and the felters. And, you know, it's got that, like, real fiber feel to it. It's, and there are animals there. It's really nice. Um, so I'm driving out with um, my friend Heidi from Undead Yarn. If you watch the Undead Yarn podcast, you have seen Heidi before. So I'm going to go pick her up in the morning. We're going to drive out. And uh, Mustache Yarns will be there as well. And so will Diane of the Suburban Stitcher podcast. So there's going to be a lot of podcasters there. If you are in the Central Texas area at all, uh, do come out. on It's on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, they've got classes. It's, it's a really nice event. Um, so I'll be there tomorrow. And other upcoming things. Sorry, my hair is kind of flopping in my face. Um... There is a, if you've not seen this on Ravelry, I encourage you to go check this out. There is uh, an event going on, uh, basically a pattern sale, a huge pattern sale going on. It happened last year. It's happening again this year. It's called the Indie Designer Gift Along, or just the Gift Along. And uh, there's a whole group dedicated to it. Just search for gift-a-long. And the basic idea is that Participating designers, any designers were allowed to sign up. Signups are now closed, so if you've missed it, I'm sorry. Um, closed for designers. But the participating designers are putting all of their, their, not all of their patterns, some of their patterns, self-published patterns, on sale for 25% off. So it's a lot of designers that you've heard of, a 
just a ton of people are participating in this. I think it's probably several hundred people. And uh, each one of them has a bundle on their website, on their designer page, that shows which patterns are eligible for this discount. And that runs from, the sale actually runs from November 13th to the 21st. It starts at 8 o'clock Eastern Time on the 13th and runs through midnight on the 21st. And then for the month following, there is a whole knit along and crochet along where you can um, basically work on the patterns that you that you purchased. And there's all kinds of prizes that they're giving away and games that they do. It's it's a really fun event and really well coordinated. I definitely encourage you to check it out, especially if you're thinking about doing any gift knitting or just, you know, would like to support independent designers. I am participating, of course. So what I'm knitting, I have uh, been knitting mainly the thing that I'm going to show you in a bit when I talk about the Bijou Basin Ranch um, yarn. But I also knitted a couple of hats this week, which I cannot show you because I have already given them to their recipients. Uh, kind of a sweet story, actually. There's a, a couple of guys who for several years have been cleaning my house. I hire them every couple of weeks to, to come out and clean the house. It's one of those things that, um, for some reason, my computer just restarted. Who knows why? Uh, but yeah, having my house cleaned is one of those luxuries that I just didn't want to give up when we scaled back when I quit my job at the university. There were a lot of things, a lot of things that we cut out of our life in order to make up for my loss of income. But that... That was not going to be one of them. I just, mm, just really didn't want to let it go. And uh, and Stephen and Jeremy are a couple that have a house cleaning business that they basically do until their film career takes off. <laughs> uh, Stephen is an aspiring actor, and they are both aspiring uh, film script writers. And I've read a couple of their scripts. They're really great. So... Uh, so yeah, they're basically just cleaning houses to support themselves until, until they get noticed. So uh, yeah, I just adore them. And they got married a couple of weeks ago, and so I wanted to make them a gift to congratulate them. So I made them hats, and they're really cute. I made a kind of uh, textured beanie for Jeremy, because he's, like my husband, he's kind of clean-shaven and has kind of a smaller head. So I made him a, you know, kind of a close fitting beanie out of a Madeline Tosh yarn that was a really nice kind of olive and deep purple variegated color. And then Jeremy's a little younger and has kind of foofy curly hair. So I made him a kind of slouchy hat out of, uh, what is this yarn? It's such a nice yarn. Cascade Yarns Cloud. Dude, if you have not knit with this yarn before, I love it. I love it so much. If you have somebody who is who complains about wool being too scratchy, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the stuff to knit with. It's a merino alpaca blend, and it's uh, chain plied, so it's just super squishy and warm. Love it. So I knit that, and then I also knit uh, this thing that I'm going to show you in a minute. So. I guess I will, I think that is all the kind of business stuff. Yeah. So now let's move on to my yarn review, which I'm excited to share with you. So this is another yarn that was sent to me by the very nice people at Stitchcraft Marketing. And if you recall from a previous episode, I, when they first approached me about starting to do reviews, or actually I approached them, but when we first started talking about it, um... Uh, I said, look, you know, I'd really kind of like to focus on stuff that lends itself either to knitting for men and boys or, uh, you know, would allow me to kind of experiment with some unusual construction type stuff. So they sent me, or they had Bijou Basin Ranch get in touch with me, and they sent me this yarn, which I've already caked up because I've been working with it. And actually, that's a good representation of the color. This is, let me show you their tag. This is Bijou Spun Sport Weight by the company Bijou Basin Ranch. 
And I'll talk more about the company in a moment, but first a little bit about the yarn. It is 100% pure yak down, and it is definitely a true sport weight. It is, it, I, I got six stitches to the inch when I knit up a fabric that I liked, and it's about 328 yards and 100 gram skein, and it is a hand wash for sure. And the, in this case, the fiber actually comes from Tibet and China, but uh, I know that some of their, some of their fiber comes from their own ranch in Colorado. So I got moss green, which is one of their lovely colorways. Their colors in this yarn tend to be uh, either very earthy colors, like they have a really nice burgundy and a really gorgeous gold and um, kind of a dark brown, a lot of neutrals. So this is moss green. And one of the things that I want you to notice about it, this isn't quite showing up as well on the camera, but you can kind of see that it has a kind of subtle heathered look to it. And I think this is just the way that the fiber takes the dye. Um, and you can particularly see right here, there are all these places where little pops of yellow poke out, which I really, really like. It's just got some really gorgeous depth of color to it. Yeah, that is exactly what the color looks like. My phone does better with color, apparently. Uh, the feel of it, it is uh, definitely next to skin soft, um, though it is not quite as soft as merino or cashmere, but or, or uh, alpaca maybe. But, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that soft in order to be so plenty soft to wear next to your skin. Um, it has a slightly more rugged feel and look without being at all scratchy. So this is one of the reasons why I thought that knitting something for for men or for outdoor wear would be great because, you know, it's definitely very comfortable on the skin, but it uh, it doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart. You know, it doesn't, I don't think that this would pill very easily, even though the the fibers are fairly fine. And I'll talk in a moment about why I think it would, you know, resist that kind of uh, abrasion pretty well. It is a wee bit hairy. And let me see if I can find... I mean, you really kind of have to hunt for them, but every once in a while, you'll get a little guard hair. And they're not super coarse, like I'm actually having a heart, that's my hair that I'm picking off right now, <laughs> not yak hair. But I know, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about, uh, Clara Parks talks about how yak fiber is gathered, and that makes sense of why you'll occasionally find a little nubbin of guard hair in here but it's, you know, it's barely perceptible. Um, I, don't, I didn't find it bothersome at all. Here's what Clara Parks in Knitter's Book of Yarn says about yak fiber. She says, I thought this was really interesting. Um, Yaks are native to Tibet, Mongolia, and South Central Asia, uh, although they have been you know, exported to other places. Uh, areas where you need a rugged outdoor outer coat to stay warm during the harsh winters. So like a lot of these animals, they have an outer coat of guard hairs and then this downy fiber underneath. And this is the down that is in this yarn. The animal releases its coat during spring molting and the fibers are either collected from the ground or combed right off the animal. Next, the rough guard hairs are removed and used for more rugged things such as rope, brushes, and tents. How well these guard hairs were removed and how fine the down fibers were underneath will dictate just how soft your yak garment will be. It's often blended with other fibers such as wool for greater strength and lower cost. And in fact, when you look at uh, Bijou Basin Ranches, uh, she, she has more to say about yak than that, but um, when you look at Bijou Basin Ranches, site you'll see that they have a lot of yak blends like there's a yak merino blend and a yak bamboo blend which i would love to i need to fondle that sometime and see what that feels like i bet that's lovely um so yeah it's uh it can be a little frail but this is spun pretty tightly let's see if you'll be able to see this It's um, a little hard to 
There we go. Maybe that'll show a little better. You can probably tell how tightly this is spun. And I think that's in order to keep it from pilling um, because the, the fiber is soft enough that it would just, the fibers would just, or not soft enough, but short enough that they would start to pill if they weren't wound pretty tightly. This is a four ply. Um, and being a four ply, it is perfect for things like cable or cabling or textured work. Uh, probably not the best for lace because it just it's a little too plump for that. Um, when I knit with this, so let me show you what I ended up making, and I'm going to I'm make actually in the process of making the other glove now. I'm making hunting gloves with this. And I'm writing up the pattern now. I will let you know when it's out. But yeah, I just, I kept looking at this yarn and thinking, this is really, it's really nice and it's really sturdy. You know, like this, this yarn's going to hold up and it's really warm. And I just thought, you know, what do I, what do I want to make with this? I don't want to make a shawl because it just... I mean, it would make a nice striped shawl, one of those kind of geometric patterns, not necessarily a lace one. But I just thought, you know, I just want, I kind of want to try something a little different. And then I was thinking about how my dad is always saying, you know, that he would really like, that he really likes, you know, kind of utilitarian knits. And that reminded me of a conversation that I had with the folks from Buffalo Wool Company a, couple, a number of years ago at TNNA about how they really wished that they had more kind of outdoor utilitarian garments in their yarns, like more patterns for that, because they had all these shawls and all these tams and all this stuff. And then they had all these people who lived in like Montana and South Dakota and Saskatchewan who really wanted to make like really warm bison sweaters to go hunting in. And they just don't have the patterns for that. So okay well let's you know kind of work with that and so I made a hunting glove you know the basic idea here is that if you're you know using a bow and arrow or a rifle that you need this finger free and I'm just gonna you know I'm gonna make the finger free on both hands it doesn't really matter whether you're right or left-handed you can use use your thumb and forefinger in both cases and then why why not just make it all gloves well the, the idea here is that the, that basically mittens keep your fingers warmer. So, you know, for these fingers that you don't need to use, you might as well take advantage of the fact that they can just all be in a mitten together and then just, you know, only keep the fingers free that you actually need to use. So the basic idea of this pattern is it's just got, it starts at the bottom. It's got what's called a beaded rib pattern down here that continues up the gusset onto thumb and the whole thumb is worked in that same beaded rib and then the rest is in stockinette and so you just work up to here work the finger work this part of the mitt and then work the thumb and it's super simple I made it extra long so that it wouldn't you know come poking out when you've got your sweater and your coat on um, and you're outside it'll stay nice and tucked in but you can obviously shorten it up if you want and I really felt like this yarn was just perfect for this kind of project. It, uh, you know, I think it would do really well in, with repeated outdoor use. It's not a precious yarn. Although, you know, it's interesting, like I talked a little bit about how the yarn is gathered. Um, this does cost $35 a skein for the 328 yards, which, you know, maybe more than your, it's kind of on the, not the not the exorbitant end, but kind of on the upper end of what you would normally pay for a for a you know a kind of indie yarn of this type. But what what you're paying for is the fact that it it's laborious to gather this fiber. You know, sort of like Kiviet is the same. Uh, Kiviet's more expensive because it's even more laborious to gather it. But basically, they uh, you don't shear a yak. <laughs> you comb or you comb a yak or you follow it around picking up fiber that has fallen off of it, which is, you know, obviously more labor intensive. So that's why it's more expensive. 
Uh, the dyeing is done for them by Lorna's Laces. I think they do some of their own dyeing and then Lorna's Laces does some of their, uh, I think particularly their variegated yarns. And uh, so they have really gorgeous colors and a lot of colors that I think would would work just as well for for men as for women, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else did I want to... When I washed this, I, this glove has been washed and blocked and I found that uh, really not much changed about the glove when I washed it. The fabric softened just ever so slightly, but it was already pretty soft before. Um, it didn't seem to grow or shrink at all. The gauge didn't change and, um, and no dye came off in the water, none whatsoever. So, you know, it was a pretty, it's pretty easy to work with in that respect. It's just, in a lot of ways, it feels like a really good classic wool. Um, a, a little bit about the company. So Bijou Basin Ranch is based near Denver, Colorado, and it's been around since 2005. You will often see them, they go to a lot of different fiber festivals, so uh, you can you can pretty easily find them. And, uh, and, and they're in a lot of yarn stores as well, but they focus on yak and yak blend yarns and um yeah i just i think there need to be more more and more patterns with with this yarn i think it's really gorgeous uh every single one of the patterns on ravelry worked up in this yarn are for women except for one baby sweater so yeah i just you know this was kind of my my big thought for today was that uh i would just really like to see more variety, you know, and and I think the the way to start, if you're the kind of person who likes to adapt knits yourself or even write your own patterns, is to think about okay, who in my life could really benefit from some knitting, and what do they need that could be knitted, and how could I go about making that? I mean, it's really not. If you've made a glove or a mitt before, this is not hard. This is. You know, something that you can, that you can come up with, you know, in some cases without a pattern, depending on how experienced you are. So, yeah, I just, I would love to see people kind of push themselves a little more to expand the boundaries of what knitting can do. It's not like it hasn't been there before. I mean, knitting has been, knitting is used for all kinds of things and has been for centuries. But, uh, but yeah, I kind of feel like the aesthetic window on knitting has been narrowing a little bit. And there's a bunch of outliers, like people designing stuff for other people and with other looks. But the mainstream has been, you know, kind of uh, narrowing for a while now. And I just want to keep, I want us to keep pushing at the, at the edges of that. Bijou Basin Ranch also sent me a sample of, oops, it kind of leaked a little bit. I didn't use all of it because I wanted to use the other part for the other mitt once I finished making it. But they sent me a sample of their new fiber wash, which is called Allure. And it is lovely. This is, uh, the scent on this is woodland mist, as you can see. And I felt like this, this would actually be a really good wool wash for men's garments because it doesn't have a floral scent to it. Um, they also have a, a scent called uh, Prairie Breeze, which is more floral. But this really does, it smells like, sort of like what you might imagine a, well not imagine, but sort of like what a forest smells like after it's rained. It's just very, very pleasant, very, very natural smell. And they also have, so they've got Woodland Mist, Prairie Breeze, and then an unscented version. And, uh, and it, it feels very similar, has a very similar impact to uh, other wool washes that I've used, like Soak and Eucalan. Um, I compared some prices on them, and uh, basically Allure is, um, it's less expensive than Soak and a little bit more than Eucalan. So it's, you know, kind of in that ballpark. It's $15 for a uh, 16 ounce or just a little bit less than 500 milliliter bottle, you know, the kind of larger bottles. And then uh, $5 for the little bottles, the three and a half ounce or 100 milliliter bottles. 
Um, one of the things I love, I was looking at the product website and it said that the, the wash contains no gluten. So just in case you accidentally eat any of it, you don't have to worry. <laughs> oh my gosh, I have to tell you this story. Oh my gosh. So I actually am kind of gluten intolerant. I'm not, I don't have celiac or anything, but I, uh, yeah, I get less, I get fewer stomach aches, the less wheat I eat. And uh, so I, I mean, this is here, neither here nor there to the story, but I was in Target the other day and there were these, I was in the bread aisle and there were these two young women, probably in their twenties standing there. And one of them picks up a box, box of, so it was either a bag of bread or a box of crackers or something. And the other woman goes, no, 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 put that down, put that down. And uh, she's like, don't get that. And the other one's like, why? And uh, she said, well, it has gluten in it. You don't want to eat gluten. And um, she says, you know what, glu what gluten is, right? And the other woman's like, no, what is it? And she says, it's the stuff they get out of animal bones. It's totally gross. <laughs> and I'm sitting there so confused. I'm like, does she, is she confusing this with bone marrow? Like, what the heck are you talking about? And so I'm just like, I'm cracking up. And I go home and tell my husband this. And he's like, maybe she's confusing it with gelatin. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, but that's exactly what she's doing. Oy. So. Allure. Now gluten-free. <laughs> Not made with animal bones, nor with wheat, but a very nice wool wash. So with that, <laughs> with that jokey ending, uh, thank you very much to Bijou Basin Ranch for sending me a sample of the yarn to work with. And I will, uh, if you're watching, I'll get in touch with you to let you know more about the pattern once it's released. I'm, I need to get in touch with my tech editor and see if she's available to take a look at this soon. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my review of Bijou Spun Sport Weight. And, uh, so now the only thing I have left to do is to do my little, um, technique segment, which, okay, so what I wanted to do was to show you this cool thing that you can do with your phone in order to help you out with color work. But the problem is that I am actually taping myself with my phone. Normally I tape myself with my computer, but my computer kept crashing while I was trying to videotape myself. So I was going to show you this thing on my phone, but I can't do that. Anyways, let me just describe to you. This will be not as cool, but I will describe to you how this works. So here's the basic idea is that I was teaching a class this week, or I'm actually in the middle of teaching a class. It's a two part class on the color affection shawl. And one of the things we focus on in the first part of the class is how to choose yarns for your shawl. So I tell them not to buy the yarn in advance that we'll talk about color theory and you know, what kind of effect you're going for. So I really like very graphic knits. So I chose colors that were really distinct from each other, but a lot of people's color affection shawls uh, have a much more subtle color difference. And both of those are fine. But, you know, what I was trying to get at is if you know the look you're going for, how do you choose yarns to achieve that look without, you know, having that disappointing thing that happens sometimes where you start knitting it up and you're like, this isn't looking the way I wanted it to at all. And this often happens with uh, with Fair Isle or Stranded Color Work too, where you think you've chosen yarns that are going to look really cool when they're worked up in the color work pattern, and then it just doesn't work. So here's, here's my tip for today, is that one of the things that you really want to watch out for when you're choosing different colors to put into the same project is that you need to pay attention to not only the difference in color, but also the difference in light value. Um, so not just the difference in hue, orange versus blue, but also how light or dark those colors are, say a very bright tangerine versus a dark navy blue. 
the more contrast there is in terms of light and dark, the more you're really going to be able to see those colors pop off of each other in your project. And um, so I'm going to use these two yarns as an example. Uh, these are two, some yarns that I bought from Lost City Knits at a, a fiber show probably about a year ago and have yet to knit them up, obviously. Um, and I bought them because I thought they would look really cool together in a project. One has this very rich kind of wine color with this, you know, some nice greens popped into it. And then this is a very light sage green. So the tip I want to share with you is that, you know, it can be hard to tell sometimes when you're looking at some yarns, especially when you've got a variegated yarn in the mix. Is there going to be enough light dark contrast between these yarns in order for them to pop off of each other? Like if I've got this, is it all the way through going to be distinct enough from this so that the colors don't muddy together? So one thing you can do is you can take your cell phone, if you've got a smartphone that can take photographs, um, especially the, the newer phones, you can take a picture of it, like hold them up, you can do this at the yarn store, right? Take a photograph of the yarn and then change the photograph to black and white, um, to grayscale. And what that does is it takes all the, all the hue out of the picture and just shows you the light versus dark. And what you would see if you did a black and white photo of this is that both of these, or all of these colors, are grays that are darker than this. This is a very, turns out it's a very light gray, and these are kind of a light medium to darker medium gray. So you are going to get significant, or significant enough, contrast between these colors that it'll work. So, sorry I didn't get to actually show you that on my camera, but what can you do? And that, I think, is all for today. You can find me online everywhere as Dark Matter Knits, including my website, which is darkmatterknits.com. Come on over to the Ravelry group, the Dark Matter Knits group there, and go ahead and enter the giveaway for Jennifer Lassan's Ayla Grace shawl. And next week I'll have another giveaway to share with you the giveaways they are amounting. And I will tell you all about Kid and You and other things. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.